so I changed changed the title, but yes. it's it's, uh, it's very overlapping with the old title. Yeah. Mm. So the new title is Groups, Games, and Knowledge. Yeah. And of course, in celebration of Ravi mm. Kulkar. Yes. Uh, Yes. Yeah, the nice thing about being an old person is that they have I have old friends like Ravi Kulkarni or Yuri Gurevich or John Crossley. And as a consequence, I get to give talks without having to go through referee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, okay. so now, uh, we have Professor Rohit Parikh from Kitty University of New York, and he's giving this talk on groups, games, and knowledge. So uh, we are happy here that he's here, and old friend of Professor Kulkarni, and now I request him to start his talk. So are these abstract groups to begin with, uh, Professor Rohit? Yes. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So you want me to start? Yeah, please start, yes. Yeah. All right, so, so the question is, why do uh, people and animals cooperate, right? And it's, of course, this cooperation is fundamental to the formation of groups. And it is groups which, have, which fight. I mean, when individuals fight, it doesn't have much of, a, much of an effect on society. But when groups fight, then it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very big thing. So the, the understanding the nature of groups is important. Now, there is, a, there is a fairly substantial philosophical community which uh, is interested in, in social epistemology, but their notion of a group believes some proposition P if the majority of them believe proposition P, right? And so the, the, so the fact that there is something more involved, the structure of the group and the structure of communication and the structure of common action, that these things are left out, right? So here's my first picture, a beehive. Now, uh, actually among, uh, among various, uh, various animal species, Humans are the only ones which are able to cooperate without a lot of biological connection. I mean, of course, we are all human and so we have similar DNA. But on the other hand, the biological connection between one human and another human tends to be very modest, right? We don't even always look alike. On the other hand, there are the bees which cooperate to build huge structures. And the question is why? The second group is Chinese troops. I believe that these troops are Chinese. They could be North Korean, but they also cooperate in a certain way and they're all holding their guns in the same posture. The third group is the Black Lives Matter, right? And they have gathered together to do something. And it's obvious that, that they don't all look alike. The person on the left is white. The person next to that person is probably black from the shape of hair and so on, so on. But they do have a common purpose. They're all marching. So for three cases, the first case is bees. The second case is Chinese troops. And the third case is BLM demonstrators. And the reasons for forming a group and coordinating are different in the three cases. Bees cooperate because they're all sisters who have the same DNA. Right? In other words, because the mother bee was fertilized at some stage in the past by some male bee, and now she's churning out thousands of babies, and all of them are exactly alike. So they have the same DNA, and from a purely evolutionary point of view, the survival of one is the survival of all. Okay, Chinese troops cooperate because they're obeying a single master. And Black Lives people cooperate because they have a single goal and they have communicated to be together at one time and place. But communication is necessary. Even a master must tell his servants what he wants them to do. BLM people must rely on email or phone calls or face-to-face -face talk to coordinate about the time and place. They can't all be marching in different places all over the place, but they all have to march together to have an effect. So, and communication is needed in order to create this situation. 
And what about bees? Social behavior in bees has a number of advantages. One of the most important these is the ability to quickly mobilize a large number of foragers to gather floral resources that may only be available for a short period of time. So the ability to communicate location with such precision is one of the most interesting behaviors of a very strong insect. And of course, this has been known since the 19th century. The recruiter of, recruitment of foragers from a hive begins when a scout bee returns to the hive and goes with nectar from a newly found nectar source. She begins by spending 30 to 45 seconds regurgitating and distributing nectar to bees waiting in the hive. Once her generosity is gathered in the audience, the dancing begins. So the dancing is the communication. In all cases, the quality and quantity of the food source determines the liveliness of the dances. If the nectar source is of excellent quality, nearly all foragers will dance enthusiastically and at length each time they return from foraging. Food sources of lower quality will produce fewer, shorter, and fewer, shorter, and less vigorous dances, recruiting fewer new foragers. Now, actually, the dance also contains information about where they have found this source of food, in what direction, and so on. So, on. and the bees actually use the position of the sun. In other words, there is an angle between the position of the sun and the place where the food is located, and they convey the angle so that the other bees know where to go. It's quite sophisticated. So I'm going to propose, propose a measure of coordination. And so we'll put aside communication and simply propose a measure of the amount of coordination how much coordination is there among bees, among Chinese troops, among bee activists? So there should be a theory of the amount of information about members of the group and the basic similarity among agents, which allows more, I, I, I hear some sound, more coordination with less communication. Shelling's focal points make a good example. So I'll say something about shelling. Thomas Shelling. Uh, was an economist who won the Nobel in 2005. And uh, it, it, the, the, the Nobel was in game keeping jointly with Robert Aumann. But I heard Schelling's talk, and his, his talk was titled, Am I a Game yeah. Theorist? Right? And if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with the works of Aumann and the work of Schelling, then you <coughs> read that the two men are quite different. Aumann is primarily a mathematician and remains a mathematician. His interest in human beings is there, but it's, it's diluted by the mathematics. Whereas with Schelling, it's the other way around. His primary interest is in human beings, and the game theory is brought out as a tool only for, for certain rather simple conclusions. And I'm not even sure that Schelling knew much mathematics. So his focal points are, are the following issue. Two people are in New York City, and they got separated, and they haven't decided where to meet. But then Schelling's point is that they will go, they will both go to Grand Central to the information booth, because that's a focal point. So when, when you don't know anything about what the other person is going to do, you gravitate in, this, in, the, in the direction of focal points. And I think that the notion of focal points is very important, even for bees and even for Chinese troops and so on. So on. Because Given a signal, there are many, many things that you, you can do, but somebody like you interprets the signal in the same way as you do. So when, when, the, when a bunch of bees observe a certain center dance, then they all go to the same place. So they're interpreting the signal in the same way. So now comes a bit of mathematics.
So consider n agents, one up to n. Each agent has a finite action space or belief space, A sub i, and a profile of actions is a tuple A1 up to A, where each AI belongs to I. So that means that agent I is doing action A sub I. They could all be taking the same action, or they could all be taking, they could be taking different actions, which are somehow cooperating. Now, let chi be the set of all possible profiles. So chi is the product of A sub I. We also assume a set P of actually possible profiles. And if P is a member of P, then it's possible that the agents act in ways AI so that P equals A1 up to AN, that is to say AI equals P sub I. So that means that if you ask somebody for a nail, then the action by him is to give you the nail and the action by you is to take the nail and these two actions are coordinated. The action by him to give, give, a, give, give a nail when you haven't asked for one is not going to occur. So not all possible profiles actually take place. He doesn't give you a nail unless you ask for it and you don't take the nail unless he gave it to you. So there are the possible profiles uh, and th these are abstractly possible profiles. So chi is those profiles which are abstractly possible, including the one where he offers you the nail, but you're not even there, or the one in which you extend the nail, your hand to take the nail, and he's not even there. Those profiles are not there, but the profile where he's giving you the nail and you're taking the nail is going to be present. So if some profile Q is in chi, but not in P, then they assume that the agents do not jointly act in such a way that the action of Agent I is Q sub I. So we don't have the, prof the, the profile where he is giving you the nail, but you're not even there, is not actual, but it's a theoretically possible one. And the, the, the theoretically possible ones are important. So here it is an example. Suppose one, two, three are three agents, and there are actions A and B for each. A stands for take care of the baby, and B for go to the beach. The first agent would prefer to go to the beach but he will take care of the bee if neither of the others is taking care of the baby. So the three profiles are ABB, BBA, BAB, and BAA. So he goes to the beach only if the, one of the others is taking care of the baby. And if they are not taking care of the baby, he takes care of the baby. So there are eight possible profiles, two times two times two, but there are only four which are actually possible. So BBB, all going to the beach, is not a possible profile because agent one will not go to the beach if the other two are going. Nor is ABA because he will not take care of the baby if number three is already taking care of the baby. And so the eight members of chi, four are in P and four are not. So the degree of coordination is defined with the log of alpha, where alpha is the size of chi divided by the size of P. In this example we gave, alpha is two and the degree is one. If every profile was possible, then alpha would be one and C would be zero. If one did not care what two and three were doing, then C would be zero. And I've noticed that some, some information transfer must be possible because somehow agent one must know those two guys are not taking care of the baby. So the number C indicates the extent to which the actions of the three agents are coordinated. And the highest degree of coordination arises when P is a singleton. So this preliminary draft, we won't ask why P is a singleton. There could be many reasons and we will not yet go into various reasons. But for example, in the case of the Chinese, uh, Chinese troops, we know it's a singleton and we know that it's a singleton because they're all obeying the commands of one commander. So given any set X, absolute X will be the cardinality of it, and LG will be locked to the base two, rather than locked to the base E. Okay. So subgroups, suppose there are two subgroups of a set of agents, and for simplicity, we will let them G1 be one up to M, and G2 be M plus one to N. Those might not be the actual groups, but we can renumber them so that all the members of, of G1 are in the first and all. Now, given a profile P of the whole group, we write P1 to be that part which is assigned to G1 and P2 to be that part which is assigned to G2.
So a profile for the whole group gives rise to two profiles for two subgroups. So let P1 be the set of possible profiles of G1 and P2 be the set of possible profiles of G2. And given two profiles, P, P and Q, we'll say P plus Q is the, is the joint profile, which is obvious to see, right? I mean, the actions of the first group and so on. Now, if any profile from here and any profile from here can be combined to make a profile for the whole group, then we will say that the two groups are independent. So this will cl clearly happen if the cardinality of P is the same as the product of the card cardinality of P1 and P2. Now the interpolation lemma will be relevant here and it's, uh, it's sometimes called Craig's theorem. Maybe Ali Khan knows it. Uh, uh, no, no, Rohit, I don't know. I think last class, one of the talks you mentioned it and I wanted to check it. I think a mathematical question is why are you choosing that exactly that log? Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, Craig is it says is it is it to make the uh, multiplicative things just additive? That is the mathematical reason. I'll I'll explain. I'll explain. Yeah. So and the other is something. Is it like some entropy or specific heat or something? <laughs> let's let's suppose that there is a Pakistani who knows yeah. Urdu and Punjabi. Ah. And there is an Indian who knows Punjabi and Sanskrit, right? Ah. If they talk to each other, then Craig, then the, then the Pakistani says something to the Indian and the Indian understands it, let's say, right? Then the Pakistani will say, then, then, then Craig would say that whatever, the, whatever was said by the Pakistani and whatever was understood by Indian must be expressible in Punjabi, which is the only common language that they have. Yes. Right? Mm. So the Indian listeners does not know Urdu, although actually quite a lot of uh, Indians do know Urdu, right? I, uh, Urdu is, is, a, is a very well studied language in India still. Okay, but, but you get Craig's point. And so you see that if there is a communication between the two groups, P1 and P2, they must involve some common vocabulary. But I'm not going to go into this point, but this would obviously come up in a further mathematical development. So we can also define the degree of coordination to be the logarithm of P1 times P2 divided by P. It will be zero if the two groups are independent. Another example, there are two kingdoms, K and K prime, and there are three fruits available, apples, bananas, and cherries. King K likes apples and bananas, but hates cherries. King K prime likes bananas and cherries, but hates apples. The, may, the king may choose whatever fruit he chooses among the ones he likes, but citizens are required to eat the same fruit as their king. So the profile for K consists of everyone eating an apple and everyone eating a banana. No one is eating a cherry because the king doesn't like cherries. For K prime, it's everyone eating bananas and everyone eating ch cherries. And since the profiles are independent, there are four profiles for the entire group. Apples, apple, right? Apples, bananas, 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 apples, cherries, bananas, cherries, those four, right? And C is zero. There is no coordination. However, let us suppose that King K prime is more powerful and it demands that the people of kingdom K eat the same fruit as the people of kingdom K prime when possible. Now, kingdom K prime can still eat apples when uh, K can still eat apples when K prime eats cherries because they don't have cherries. But they're forbidden to eat apples when K prime eats bananas. If if that king eats bananas, they must eat bananas because among their two choices, bananas and apples, they must choose the one that the other king chooses. So P1 and P2 remain the same as before and have size two each, but the profile, everyone eating apples and everyone eating bananas vanishes. So now P is size three and C rises from zero to 0.41. I know this mathematics is all rather simple for people like Ravi, but nonetheless, I'm propounding it. The demand of King K prime clearly requires communication, and we conjecture that communication increases the value of C. If there is no communication, then C must of necessity be zero. 
Because how could the kingdom, uh, how could, could kingdom K know that they are eating banana? Uh, so restriction R on P is a non-empty subset Q of P. So we write Q equals RP, and we also think of R not as a particular re restriction. but as a map from profiles to subsets of profiles. So here is an example. So a system of commands from kingdom, king K prime to kingdom K is a map from K prime to set R of restrictions. So the king K prime can say, from now on, you're only allowed to have such and such profiles. An identity command at ease, and the Sanskrit word is aran, right? Uh, leaves P as it is, the intuition is that when K prime has a certain profile P, then it sends a restriction to K, which thinks the possible profiles for K. Assuming that at least one of the commands is the identity, if on occasion the king says, do what you like, then they will do what they like. So the profile P stays as it is, but the joint profile shrinks, raising the value of C. So we'll see that R is at least as strict as R prime if for all sets of profiles P, R of P subsets of R prime of P. It is more strict if for at least some sets of profile R P is a strict subset of R prime P, and the system of commands is more strict if all the restrictions in S are at least as strict as those of S prime, and at least one is more strict. So if S is more strict than S prime, then there is more coordination with S than with S prime. Now, there is obviously an algebra of restrictions. For instance, there could be a restriction on the speed at which you can drive and also a restriction on the amount of alcohol you can imbibe before driving. These are two separate res restrictions which decrease the set of profiles available to you. But these two restrictions commute and the algebra will be simple. There may be other restrictions where R prime makes no sense unless R has been implemented. So, for example, in a community where you're not allowed to drink alcohol at all, the restriction about the amount of alcohol will become irrelevant. Now, suppose that there are two religions in the same community, we'll call them Hindu and Muslim, without intending any particular meaning, though of course the meaning is intended, then they also have holidays, D, which is Diwali, and R, which is Ramadan. So most Hindus observe Diwali, but not all. Most Muslims observe Ramadan, but not all. Also, some Hindus observe Ramadan, and some Muslims observe Diwali. So assume that in each community, 70% observe their own holidays, and 20% observe the holiday of the other community. Also, 5% in each community observe both holidays, and that leave 15% in each community who observe neither. Assuming the communities to be equal sizes, we can calculate the degree of coordination in each community, as well as the coordination within the whole society. Okay, now let's suppose that a given profile P, it results in payoff UI plus UPI to member I of the group. So we would like to suggest that ideally, each group should coordinate its actions so as to min maximize the welfare of the whole group. But how do we define the welfare of the whole group? In other words, the profile gives welfare to each person, but we want the group to be better off. And so how do we define the welfare of the group from the welfare of the individuals? So we would define the welfare to be the sum of the UPIs but we would also like the various UI to be reasonably equal. The sum does not enforce equality. So for example, if, if I have a million dollars and I give uh, 999,000 to Anne and $1 to Bob, then both, they're both better off, but it's clearly not equitable. Now, Rawls in his uh, theory of justice, uh, this very famous, work, uh, which I don't know if everybody knows, so his theory of justice is very influential.
and in a way harmful. I'll explain in what ways I'm harmful. So he would say the welfare of the whole group is defined in the following way. Take the person whose welfare is the least and multiply that by the number of people. So that's the, so UPI is the minimum and now you multiply it. So from Rawls point of view, a society of three people in which the incomes are 101, 101 and 101 is better than a society with incomes of 100, 200, 300 since the minimum in the first society is higher. Now, I don't know with, with, uh, whether Rawls ever uses it, but Rawls is essentially using Who's using what is called and I so to make a small political point, I think it's this way of looking at this thing which has led to discrimination against Asians at the great universities like Harvard and Yale and so on and so on. Because the point of view of Harvard and Yale is these people are already smart, they're doing very well, so why should we give them anything? And they don't admit. They do admit Asians, but you can see why the, their feelings towards Asian, admitting Asians is dilute. Okay. Is it a book now, by Rawl? Pardon me? Is that a book by Rawl? Yes. Can you give the details, sir? The uh, title, etc. Well, if you go to face, if you go, I'm sorry, if you go to Amazon uh, and choose books and then you type Rawls and theory of justice, the book will immediately come up and it shouldn't be expensive. It's, it's a paperback. And then I don't know whether there, there is a cheap edition, but of course it's always possible to steal books, which our Russian friends will help us to do. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the following possibly apocryphal so story about the mathematician Norbert Wiener. Ravi, did you know Norbert when you were at Harvard? Did you meet him? Uh, you're yeah, muted. You're muted. He used to come to Harvard. Uh, yeah. Yes. I've, I've met him at True Divinity Hall many times. Yes. yes. And every time <laughs> he met me, he would ask me which part of India I was from. No, even though he already, yeah, he already, yeah, he already asked the question before and given the answer. But then here is a personal story which I, of which I, I can only guess the reason, which is that I went through a rather troubled time when I, was, when I was a senior and then I started seeing a therapist. And my therapist received a letter from Norbert Wiener who said, Roy is a is very, very talented mathematician and you must take good care of him. I was puzzled by this letter because Norbert didn't even know which part of India I was from. But then I realized later what the reason was. It was Pesi Masani. Hmm? Hmm. Pesi Masani was a mathematician at Elphinstone College. He was yes. also a Harvard graduate and he was the person who sent me to Harvard. And Pesi Masani was also very close to Norbert Wiener, he actually eventually wrote a biography. So I have a suspect suspicion that Pesi Masani said to Norbert Wiener, you better take care of this guy, Ruit. Pesi, Pesi Masani was close. Was what? Uh, Pesi Masani and Abhyankar, who yes. started this institute, they were also close yes. in English. But Abhyankar didn't have a high opinion of Basani. May I, may I tell is, the story? May I tell the remark that Abhyankar made about Basani, or is it to be? No, kept? no, no, no. I think uh, <laughs> no, uh, Abhyankar's opinion should not be taken as any criterion of anything. But it's amusing because Abhyankar <laughs> was was given to <laughs> to make remarks, which were in a way he one could say that Abhyankar was honest but not tactful. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, at one time, the Wieners were moving, and in the morning, as he was going to work, Mrs. Wiener said to him, now don't come home to this address in the evening, and she gave him a piece of paper with the new address. 
However, the evening, Wiener found himself standing in front of the old address and not knowing what to do because he had already lost the slip of paper with the new address. So he went to a little girl standing by and said, little girl, do you know where the Wieners have to move to? And the little girl replied, daddy, mom knew what would happen. So she sent me to fetch you. <laughs> 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 so he, he, he did not remember even his own daughter. <laughs> <laughs> the same joke had been doing rounds about Albert Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> no, Albert Einstein knew his children very well. They, they, I'm, sure, I'm sure he did, yes, yes, right. So this is, these are two Australian, not Australian, Austrian uh, psychologists. Uh, quite famous, but I think they have not received as much credit as the two Americans, uh, P. Mac and Woodruff. And uh, at University of Pennsylvania. So Weber and Perner are concerned primarily with the perception by children of other people's mindsets. And the following quote from them is a story about Maxi. Maxi is a fictitious children, but the children who are being told the story are real. Mother returns from a shopping trip. She bought chocolate for a cake. Maxi may help her put away the things. He asks her, where should I put the chocolate in the blue cupboard, says the mother. Now you can see that there are several small mistakes of English, but I left them as they are because Wimmer and Perner are Austrians and they're allowed to use English as they like. So uh, Max is putting away the things and he says, where should I put the chocolate? And mother says, in the blue cupboard. So later with Maxi gone out to play, the mother transferred the chocolate from the blue cupboard to the green cupboard. Maxi then comes back from the playground. He's hungry and he wants to get some chocolate. So in Weber and Perner's experiment, little children who were told the Maxi story were then asked the belief question, where will Maxi look for the chocolate? Now remember that Maxi put the chocolate in the blue cupboard. He went out to play. Mother transferred it to the green cupboard while he was gone. He comes back. So where will Maxi look for the chocolate? And Children the age of three invariably got the answer wrong and assumed that Maxi would look for the chocolate in the green cupboard where they knew it was. It's in the green cupboard. Why wouldn't he look in the green cupboard? Even children aged four or five had only a one third chance of correctly answering this question or an analogous question involving Maxi and his brother who also wants the chocolate and who Maxi wants to deceive. Now, children aged six or more were, by contrast, quite successful in realizing that Maxi would think that the chocolate would be in the blue cupboard where he had put it. And if he wanted to deceive his brother and prevent him from getting chocolate, he would leave him to, towards the green cupboard. So, uh, according to Jerry Fodor, He was a professor at MIT, then he came to City University, and then a year or two left, he uh, later, he left City University for Rutgers, and now he has passed away. He was quite famous. Uh, I don't agree with all of his ideas, but he was brilliant. Okay, so Jerry Fodor's uh, explanation for this is that the brains of small children are too small, and they are not able to entertain two sets of beliefs, their own which is that the chocolate is in the green cupboard and the Max's belief, which is that the chocolate is. So there are two sets of beliefs involved, their own green cupboard and Max's belief, which is blue. And because they're not able to have two beliefs in their own, uh, own uh, head, they, they opt for the one which they know is true. I don't know whether Fodor theory is correct or not, but this is an explanation of and of. Uh, he is Fodor a philosopher, psychologist, what? A philosopher. And his, his, his wife, uh, Janet Fodor, is, is a professor at CDC. The, the two of them came to CUNY together, and she stayed at CUNY, and he went to Rutgers. 
I know him reason. I know her reasonably well, and I've met him a couple of times. So this seems that representation of other people's mindset comes fairly late in childhood, well after they have learned to deal with notions of belief and belief-based actions for themselves and for others who share their own view of reality. Chris Steinswald is a former student of mine. He investigates modern logics which are intended to represent the states of minds of young children. And uh, the say, says SP, which means it's a joint paper by him and me, but in fact, the paper was written entirely by him. And uh, I would say that putting my name in there is something of a present. He's, he's very, very smart, very smart. Uh, but one could say that in some ways, if I may forgive, be forgiven, his mind is also similar to the minds of the three-year-old children. And I would say that the defect, this defect is common to the male gender. <laughs> so, so you have, so let's suppose that you have a conjecture and you have, a, you have found a proof which you are not sure is correct. And then you go to see your professor, right? And he spends the entire interview half an hour about his own work and what he's thinking and so on and so forth. And half an hour later, you leave and he has never said anything about your theorem, right? And it's because he's not aware. He doesn't say to himself, why did this guy to come to see me? He wants me to check his proof, right? And I know people who are actually like that. And it's very common in the male gender. It does occur in the female gender, but not as common. But there is a famous woman whose name I can't remember. Uh, but uh, uh, there is a famous psychologist who wrote the book, the man who, who wrote, who thought his wife was a, and he flew all the way to Arizona to meet her, right? She's, she's bipolar. And uh, he was sitting in his office. He had already had a long flight and she did not even offer him a glass of water. So, uh, but she's unusual and uh, this defect is very common in the male gender. And if I may say, this defect is shared by both Putin and Trump who have no idea what somebody else is thinking. All right, so here's the money, money puzzle, children puzzle. How much longer do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. So uh, then I will skip the muddy children puzzle. And I will say something about the about the pedestrian. So this story is uh, due to my friend. I met him when I was a graduate student at Harvard and he was a postdoc at Harvard. He's a well-known psychologist. But he is past him. And uh, he's, he was from Naples and he described his, his device which uh, is used in Naples, but also in India. Namely, you're crossing a street and, the, and a car is coming and you pretend not to see the car. So hmm. uh, the pedestrian will pretend not to notice the car. So uh, thereby preventing the driver knowing that you know about the car, where C is representing the car, D being the driver and P the pedestrian. If the driver knew what the pedestrian knew, he might try to drive aggressively and try to pull the pedestrian into running or withdrawing. But if he doesn't know that the pedestrian uh, uh, knows, he will be more cautious. So let me, there is an example from the Mahabharata which I'll skip. Okay, so here are the motorist choices, the pedestrian choices. The, so the motorist can go or not go, and the, I'm sorry, the pedestrian can go or not go, and the motorist can go or not go. Now, if they both go, then the pedestrian will be injured and the motorist might lose his license. 
So payoffs are minus 100 for the pedestrian and minus 10 for the motorist. If the pedestrian goes and the motorist does not go, then it's one for the pedestrian, he gets to cross the street and the motorist doesn't get anything. On the other hand, if the pedestrian doesn't go and the motorist goes, then it's zero one. And finally, if neither goes, then it's zero zero. Now you can see that this is a Nash equilibrium. Why? Because from this position of my, um, this, oh, no, I'm sorry, this, no, I, I'm sorry, uh, sorry. I should, uh, this is a, these two are Nash equilibrium. Because if the pedestrian is going, the motorist by also going switches from one to minus 10, which he shouldn't. If the motorist is already going, then the pedestrian uh, choosing from uh, one to zero also doesn't gain, right? So one to zero is down, uh, zero, uh, one to minus 10 is also down. However, the point is that this equilibrium is more stable because the loss to the pedestrian by going to minus 100 is much bigger than the loss to the motorist by going to zero, right? So this equilibrium is much more stable than that one. They're both equilibrium. Now, however, if the pedestrian doesn't know that the motor is going, then this portion vanishes, right? And now the only choices are one zero and zero zero, and the poor mo motorist has to go along with the one zero, right? So by pretending not to know, the pedestrian erases this column, and in this column, he goes and the motorist doesn't go. Okay, uh, do I have another uh, seven, eight minutes? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, good, good, good. So then let me go to the Mahabharata. So the Mahabharata is believed to be the longest single work in the world. It describes, it's, it's several times longer than the, uh, than the Odyssey and the, uh, and the other one put together, Iliad and the Odyssey put together. It describes a political struggle between the two sets of, of uh, cousins, the Pandavas and the Kauravas, in a crucial battle between the two sets of cousins, which is in fact the battle of Mahabharata, Krishna is an advisor to the Pandavas, but out of a sense of fair play, he gives his army to the Kauravas. And the story is that Arjuna and uh, Duryodhana both go to Krishna to ask him for his help. And Duryodhana being arrogant, uh, Krishna is sleeping and Duryodhana being arrogant sits at the head of Krishna and Arjuna being more humble sits at his feet. When Krishna wakes up, he sees Arjuna first and then Duryodhana. And then so he says to Arjuna, he says, since I saw you first, you have a choice. My army on one side and me on the other side, which one would you choose? And Arjuna says, I choose you and Duryodhana chooses Krishna's army. So the Krishna's army fought along with the Kauravas. Now, at a crucial juncture, Drona, a powerful warrior, warrior on the Kaurava side, who is also the teacher of both of them, turns out to be invincible battle, and the Pandavas are hard pressed. They don't know what to do. So Krishna thinks of a strategy. Drona's only son is called Ashwatthama and an elephant owned by the Pandavas is also called Ashwatthama. So Krishna suggests that the Pandavas kill the elephant Ashwatthama and then announce that the man Ashwatthama has been killed. After a great deal of hesitation and soul searching, self-interest prevails. The Pandavas do kill the elephant and announce to Drona that Ashwatthama is dead. Drona is a little suspicious but he knows that one of the Pandava brothers, Yudhishthira, never lies because he was the son of Dharma 
and dharma stands for duty. So he asked Yudhishthira, who confirms that Aswatthama is dead, muttering in an aside, either man or elephant. And there's a very famous Sanskrit saying, Narova Kunjarova. I suspect that at least half of the audience knows this. Yes, yes. Oh. So not knowing about the elephant, Drona assumes it's his son who is dead, lays down his weapons, and is killed by a warrior on the Pandava side. So the game theory analysis is Drona's two options are F for fight and N for not fight. And before the announcement, his preferences were F bigger than N. And given his prowess, any warrior who faced him faced death. But after the announcement that Ashwatthama was dead, his preference is changed to N greater than F. He can be attacked with impunity. Ashwatthama, of course, was not dead and took terrible revenge on the Pandavas, including the killing of some unborn Pandava children. And for this, he was punished by being condemned to live forever and to wander the earth as a pariah. And I believe that this story is similar to the story of Cain. Okay, so now I've done enough of the informal stuff, and let me say something about the mathematics. No, Cain and Abel, I think we, we do not know here. I think. No, but uh, there isn't any of that much time, right? Okay. No, I think you can, you can take your time. Yours is the last talk of the whole thing. Okay, so uh, let's, let's suppose a ballot box whose function is to create certain specific states of knowledge and suppose that five people, one, two, three, four, are debating whether to have lettuce or cucumbers for salad. They cast their votes into a ballot box, and the final count reveals that lettuce is one by three votes to two. Let's see I, I greater than equal to five, mean that I voted for cucumber, and similarly for lettuce. Then the propositional formula which expresses that exactly two voted for lettuce and three for cucumbers is common knowledge because the ballot box is opened and there are five disjunctions. For example, the first two voted for lettuce and the last. So here are three votes for lettuce and two votes for cucumbers and so on. So, forth. so that's known to everybody. Also, what is known is that no one knows nobody's anybody else's vote. So it's common knowledge. I'm sure the reader can see the game theoretic reasons for these two knowledge facts. Everyone must know the results of the election, and the letters party must not be in a position to take revenge on the two good cameras. So your vote is supposed to be secret, and not only is it supposed to be secret, you are not even given to given put in the position where you could voluntarily tell your vote to someone else, because if you could, then you could be bribed or threatened. So no one else can know your vote. Okay, so now we come to some technical results. And these results are joined with Paul Krasutsky. was my student. So we, are, so we assume a simple language. There are n propositional variables. So L0 is all the propositional variables. LG is all Boolean combination of PI. So P1 implies P2 would be LG. So the PI are the basic ground facts. Then LG represents, represents all ground facts, knowledge free. So, if the, so, for example, if the sun is shining, if the sun is up, then there is light. That's a basic, that's a, that's a knowledge-free ground fact. Now we have N agents, and we define the full language. The language is closed under negation and disjunction. And moreover, uh, if, if the formula is in the language, then I knows A is also the language doesn't have to be true. It just has to be able to be saved. I'm not going to talk about common knowledge, so I will cross this out. 
So I will also leave aside cryptic structures and go to the next part. So the crucial fact is that uh, a formula or the form I knows that J knows that J knows P is equivalent. So if I knows A, then I knows that I knows. So if I have a string of the form, I'll not use some subject k1, k2, k2, k3, p implies k1, k2. In other words, a doubling of the K2 doesn't give you anything more. What you know, you know that you know. This is a well-known action. Now, there's a group here is Graham Higman. Some of you may have heard of him. Right, he, he's the first person. He proved the undecidable theory of groups. Graham Higman. Yes. Okay, so take the alphabet whose, whose main symbols given up to K to K N. And let's suppose I have a string X A Y A if and only if X A A Y A. <coughs> so a doubling of A makes no effect. So we now define the level of knowledge of A in that group to be the set of all strings X such that X A is true. And for simplicity, X has no substrings where something is doubled. So now we have an ordering that X is less than Y. If every symbol X occurs of, of Y. So Rohit, what uh, what are you driving after? I mean, I understand I'm, each each statement, but yeah, I'll I'll, I'll come I'll come to the result. Occurs in X in the same order and doubling. So this is an ordering, right, on strings, right? Mm. Now, based on results of Kigman and others, it turns out that this ordering is a well partial order. And what does that mean? It not only is a well ordering, it's a partial ordering, but it's well ordering, uh, it's well founded. There are no infinite descending sequences, but so no infinite, descending sequences and every set of mutually so not every not every well well partial not every well ordered partial ordering has this property. This is a stronger property. And now it turns out, so if I have a set like this, and let's suppose. These are all the strings in X, right? Then these are all, so this is X. Uh, X and this I'll write as minus X. Okay, so this is a set of strings in X and this is a strings of, set of strings not in X. 
given that it's wealth partial ordering, that it, look at all the first elements which are not inside. They're incomparable. So take the lowest elements in not X. It's a finite set because they are all incomparable and being well partial ordering, uh, it has to be finite. So that means that you can decide these things as all the things which are not greater than one of the one of those, right? So X has a, has a very simple structure. And X represents the knowledge situation in a group of agents. Like for example, if there are, there are Ann, Bob and Charlie and it's raining, let's say they all know that it's raining. Ann knows that Bob knows it's raining. Bob knows that Charlie knows it's raining. And Charlie knows that Ann is, knows that it's raining. But Ann does not know that Charlie knows that it's raining. Charlie does not know that Bob knows it's raining. And Bob knows that it, Ann doesn't know that it's raining. This seems sort of strange, but this situation can in fact be achieved and it's possible. So it's a level of knowledge where you have Ann, Bob, Bob, Charlie, Charlie, Ann, and do not have Ann, Charlie, Charlie, Bob, and Bob, Ann. So I'll, repeat, I'll write this down. So we have Ann, Bob, Bob, Charlie, and Charlie, Ann, and do not have So they all know that it's raining. Anne knows that Bob knows it's raining. Bob knows that Charlie knows it's raining. Charlie knows that Anne knows it's raining. But we do not have the opposite. Anne does not know that Charlie knows. Charlie does not know that Bob knows. Bob does not know that Anne knows. And how could we have achieved this? And in fact, Shakespeare uses this device in, in uh And Shaw, Bernard Shaw uses it. Man of destiny. So the, the set of levels of knowledge is is uh, is very uh, very very simple. And uh, there is another student of mine, Eric Packwood, and he and I considered states of belief. And so there are only countably many states of knowledge. But there are only, but there are uncountably many states of belief, and unfortunately, he graduated. We never published the results, and now I don't know that he remembers the proof, and I don't. Okay, so now I will I will end the story by uh, end this end my talk with a with a with a remark, which is supposedly due to Napoleon and a person that played the man of destiny. So there is a there, there was a rumor that Napoleon's wife Josephine was unfaithful and had an affair with a man called Baras, whom she had in fact known before she knew Napoleon. We don't know whether the story is true or not. But in any case, after a certain battle, which is just one uh, Napoleon is, receives a batch of dispatches about his next battle. And he also receives a letter, which he has not yet opened. So a beautiful woman disguising herself as a, as a soldier uh, makes her way into uh, Napoleon's tent and tries to steal the letter. But Napoleon intercepts her and prevents her from stealing the letter. And then th this woman is not Josephine, but presumably is a friend of Josephine. And so Napoleon suspects that the letter is about Josephine's infidelity to him. And this woman is a friend of Josephine's who doesn't want Napoleon to find out that Josephine uh, was unfaithful. This is all Shaw's imagination. We have no idea whether Josephine was faithful or not. But in any case, so Napoleon says, he says, if a, man, if a, if a letter describing a wife's infidelity was sent to a husband, the husband would not read it. And why? <laughs> because what man wants to fight a do a, <laughs> create a scandal and so on and so forth when he can simply uh, escape all that 
by not reading the letter, right? And such issues are discussed in another, with another student of mine. Her name is She's Turkish and she graduated, I think in 2013, uh, quite brilliant. And, uh, but, but unfortunately after getting her degree then she didn't do any more, uh, more, any more didn't want to do any more work. She's, she's very well paid. She's a vice president at uh, uh, Morgan Stanley. And so why would she want to be a mere professor? Okay. So I would finally tell, tell you the last story about her and the novelist Robert Alman. <clears throat> okay, so there was a there was a talk uh, at uh, at this, there is a Stony Brook uh, conference on game theory, and I was sitting next to Robert Alman, and uh, uh, the talk was going on. It may be that Nash was the speaker. I'm not sure, but uh, and Dostomir was also there. And after the talk was over, then Alman wanted to know. Uh, know about three things. One of them was the einstein podolsky rosen paradox. The other one was Storinger's cat. And the third one is a puzzle which I don't remember, but it's popularized by Robert Nosek. So there were three puzzles about which Alman wanted to know. He didn't know any of them. He didn't, he, I mean, he had heard of the EPR paradox, but he didn't exactly know what it was, right? Tastamir knew all three of them. Right? And she knew perfectly well that she was talking to a novelist because she, this, this, this conversation took place in 2013 and he got his Nobel Prize in 2005. So she was talking to a novelist and she had already shown that she knew three things which she didn't know. And what were the reaction of most people? Then they would try to befriend Alman, maybe get a letter of recommendation or whatever it is, or maybe try to visit Hebrew University. And what did Tastimi do? She just turned around and walked away. And I think that many Indian girls also have this temperament. They can be extremely smart, know a lot, and they just don't want to push themselves forward. And Tastimi didn't. I don't know whether it's good or bad, but uh, student, student, all of these students, Eric Pakuit, Robert, uh, Paul Pasutsky, Tastamir, I mean, it, it's like gems that CUNY gave to me. Okay, so I'm done and thank you very much for listening. Yeah, are you, um, are you reading what's going on in India in the last two, three weeks? About what? About this Varanasi temple. No. Masjid. No, what I hear about is India's insistence on remaining neutral between Russia and Ukraine. No, that is different. That's a different issue. Yeah, I don't this know is... the Varanasi issue. Yeah. That the uh, Masjid, which was built by uh, suppose, supposedly built by Aurangzeb. Uh -huh. They they found a shivling there. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it now it is the issue that uh, Hindus believe in idols. Yeah, and the Muslims don't believe uh, whatever they they actually hate uh, hate idols. Right, 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 right. And the main issue is how to get these groups together yes. without without violence. Right. So, what is your? Uh, you make your assumptions, or and so. I think this. If you can say something on this issue. Yeah, I can. I can. I can because it's yeah. it's a very important issue to me. I would say yeah. it's one of the most important issues in the world. Yes. So first of all. I uh, suggested to you, and I think that the, that the executive committee is in favor of this idea, which is that the SIAA should announce a prize of, uh, I think, 15,000 rupees first prize, uh, 10,000 rupees second prize, and 7,000 rupees third prize to uh, available to all Indian students and maybe also to Indian faculty who will write an essay of maybe a few thousand words on how Hindus and Muslims can reconcile. 
right? So this is one idea, and they should so they should make practical suggestions. Now there is a much milder suggestion that I have, uh, which is the following: that we have two great Indian musicians. Let me yes. I'm looking for blank space. Ah, here's here's blank space. So we have. And stars Zakir Hussain. Two really great musicians. And I have to say, the pride of India. Of course, Ravi Shankar is much more famous than Zakir Hussain. But, uh, <coughs> but, uh, but uh, Zakir Hussain is currently considered to be the best tabla player in the, in the world. Although there is a young Indian girl uh, who is very, very good and I have a feeling that five years from now, she will be the next Zakir Hussain. But in any case, what I say is, why not Pandit Zakir Hussain? And Ustaz, why do why do we keep this distinction, right? I mean, Zakir Hussain. Uh, I mean, he is an expert and he's also a teacher because Sufala is a student of his. The, so what the are you driving at? Huh? A student of his. My point is that. Uh, Indian Muslims, in much of the notations, uh, stick uh, stick to names which are of Arabic origin and not to names which are of Indian origin. But there is there is a there is a lot of there is there are lots of names and words in Sanskrit which have no religious significance whatsoever. Like King Ashoka, right? Uh, he was a Hindu and he became a Buddhist, but Ashoka simply means without sorrow. So I think that there should be more interchange of names and more interchange of words. No, the, I think these are the, the, these are these are what are you you're saying is to this these are two two large issues. I, I would <laughs> like to restrict the uh, whoever want to talk about this to scientists mainly, yes. mainly scientists. Right and. Uh, I think there are very few people who hate science yes, among the scientists, right. Right. and they all like science. Yes. So we should, uh, I would suggest you put the theories in such a way where yes. we use scientific methodology. That is true, yes. Scientific methodology, and, right. then, uh, uh, and then just take a vote or then just uh, try to uh, try them to choose between. Uh, I, 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 just destroying the idols or yes. uh, deifying the idols. Yes, deifying so the idols, right. Uh, uh. Now notice, so notice that Vedanta and Arya Samaj have both defanged the idols, right? They're both branches of Hinduism. Vedanta yes. is a branch of Hinduism and so is Arya Samaj and neither yes. of them uses idols. So I would yes. think that maybe if this is popularized to, to Muslims and you could say, we understand that you don't want to follow yes. Vedanta or Arya Samaj, but at least you should have a softer attitude towards that. Yeah, okay. May I Deal. chip in, Professor Kulkarni? Yes. I don't Please think do. name changing is going to resolve such uh, problems. Uh, I mean, that's uh, uh, that's definitely not going to add up. Uh, the thing is that uh, whereas uh, in India, uh, such instances are you know plenty. Yes. Every now and then, uh, there are uh, issues involving the you know discovery or quote unquote invention of idols uh, buried um, yes. uh, uh, you know, under the rubble uh, or under those buildings uh, where mosques are in place. And in other countries, it is the other way around. So uh, I don't think um, much can be done about it other than 
let the sleeping dogs lie. I mean, wherever we may have whatever, uh, let it stay where it is. And uh, of course, I mean, there are politicians and other, you know, I would say. No, no, but uh, I would say that scientists, scientists should contribute something. Yes. Scientists uh -huh. with the scientific methodology. Yes. Use the scientific methodology. Right. Well, and I mean, they should uh, contribute something. Okay, okay. I mean, yeah, uh, uh, scientists should not be silent on such issues. I but, completely agree. You know, yeah. for, for example, today it, uh, there has been a similar case and perhaps far more formidable involving the, you know, the Kutub Minar, where it is said that 27 uh, uh, temples have been, uh, quote unquote, destroyed to erect, uh, you know, that monument over there. And then uh, the issue is pending in the court and it's going to come out with a verdict uh, any time now. The thing is, uh, it might perhaps resist scientific uh, <clears throat> attempts uh, to resolve these issues. The issue is entirely political and has to be addressed as such. Uh, I think uh, what we have to do is to, you know, uh, use our, you know, influence whatever it is, or if there is any, to bear upon those who are calling the shots and tell them, uh, you know, to stop this uh, nonsense and, uh, you know, be done with this because this country cannot afford uh, using its and uh, rather, you know, frittering away its energies and resources on inanities. I mean, these things are not going to add up. Other than that, I don't think uh, scientists are capable of doing anything better than this. Uh, be, you know, you know, get together, get their act together and raise yeah. their voice. May, 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 I, may I speak? May I speak? Yep. Okay. I have a feeling that in this community, when you, when you say science, you probably mean things like differential equation, differential geometry, number theory, and so on and so forth. But the, the parts of science which are relevant here are game theory and graph theory. And I would say the study of groups, how they arise and so on and so forth is very, very important. And I would say that science can come in, but science can come in via understanding. And that's what my talk was about because the talk is, I didn't, didn't have a single differential equations, uh, no, no calculus, nothing like that. But much of the work is in fact scientific and I, I, I use the results of Higman. So I think scientists can try to understand it and maybe they can do something. Okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Parikh, uh, for this very good talk and uh, provoking and on a totally different topic than uh, I think. Let us we shall go on talking. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I thank you and let yes. us give a big hand to Professor Parikh for this uh, nice talk. And I also declare two things that is, first of all, I thank uh, the uh, people on the organizing committee who helped. Uh, to for the organization of this international conference. I thank all the speakers uh, for taking part in it. Although online, although I want they should come here and in offline mode, there will be better discussions. But still, they participated and it was very useful for all. And therefore, we are thinking that for these uh, lectures, they, we have recorded these lectures and with the permission of those speakers, we will be putting them on the YouTube also for those who want to see those lectures later on. And also, uh, as Professor Karmeshu has suggested that uh, there can be proceedings of these talks. So those speakers who want to write an article based on their talk, they are uh, most welcome and are requested to do so. Uh, if people do not find time in such cases, we can even uh, publish the part of the their PPT also with information, but people are the speakers are requested to actually write the uh, in the article form, and then we try to have a proceedings of this conference. Oh, wonderful! Uh, yeah, I also thank all the chairperson yeah. for these talks and office people for helping in the activity. Uh, I especially thank the local people, Professor Solapurkar, Professor Acharya. And Devendra Tiwari is also here because Zadar is here. Uh, so they helped a lot in this conference. So I thank you all again. And now I declare that this uh, conference is over. And this is because of Professor Kulkarni's 80th birthday. So uh, 
people have come and lectured because of him that we know and we thank professor kulkarni also for allowing us to organize this conference uh, and uh, we wish very good life active life present life and uh, uh, happy life for the years to come and uh, i hope that he will be guiding us in the years to come too uh, he has specifically come to india after his 40 years in us yes and, uh, that has helped india a lot he has students in different places iit hri in pune also and he is giving lectures in different parts of the country he has uh, started this idea of regional programs because of which many colleges and universities they are getting very good and uh, also through sia and arsi also he has helped many mathematics activities and other activities and i also thank the colleagues of him in SR, sia as well as uh, arsi rc for uh, their keen interest in the these mathematics activities in india so thank you all again and uh, you may continue the discussion after this but officially i declare that this conference is over thank you very much yeah, let me just say i am very very grateful to bhaskara tere pratishthan particularly katre and gangopadhyay who arranged this conference and it has gone very well and the, the function is going on for uh, four or five days and it was not because of uh, my my uh birthday was celebrated only for 2 hours 3 hours and then the rest are uh, the people who have spoken here they are the real contributors thank you thank you very much thank you okay so i think uh roy this is the uh, last day of the conference and the last hour so uh -huh. yeah well i'm hoping that some people will join me in this uh, in this uh, yeah there are investigations yeah, yeah I mean, there are some people here who are interested yeah. in this particular will way of thinking yeah uh, you see as a, a game theory is not the uh, something with the audience here uh, know very well yeah graph theory they do yes yeah the problem is that you mathematicians most of you are used to very very difficult work right and if you try to learn game theory you might then come to the conclusion oh this is so simple i'm not interested but you should be interested yeah. because even if it's simple yeah, be, because it's important yes what what, what you are saying is it's it's important yes. it's important for uh, social harmony yes and we can possibly with our mathematical minds we can uh, uh, increase this social harmony well another area um, distinct from uh, game yeah. theory is this uh, theory of uh, fair division and conflict resolution oh, yes. which are which are which yes. are you know which are branches of uh, another uh, you know technical area of mathematics back to majors uh, rohit right. uh, rohit Ro has worked rohit has worked on many of these things he has yes. some Yes, so right. software, yeah, yeah. social software right. that yeah. he talks about, and about yeah. fair division. Stephen Brams, who has worked on it, is yes, a, yes, a friend yes. of mine. He's a yes, friend a of book. mine. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Let me talk about myself. Stephen Brams is a friend of mine, and uh, the the program for fair division uh, that's that's on the web was written by one of my students, and Brams was also on the dissertation committee of that student, Eric Pakwit. Now, please continue. Great. So yes. yeah. So I think I think that th this is a, this is a very important very important area. I mean I think that that mathematician should not be deterred by the fact that it's easy. Yeah. Yeah, I do have his book, Bram's book. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Maybe you and I can correspond after the meeting you can Yeah, me. why not? Yeah, I need to learn yeah a little bit more about this. Yes. Yeah, I mean I encountered this area while I was trying to understand vector majors. Um, yes. Uh, so you know lyapunov convexity theorem and stuff like that it does I lead see. to yeah you know you know these issues uh, involving right. fair uh, division and conflict resolution yes and stuff like that <clears throat>
yeah, so we, we should we should be in touch. I think I think that this is uh, yes, this is sure. Me uh, so, okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what Professor Kulkarni was uh, beginning to ask in the after the your talk was over. I mean, that's a very, very important question. I mean, uh, in so far as uh, the social dynamics of this country is concerned, uh, we need to do something, uh, you know, concrete and uh, rather than uh, sit on the sidelines and uh, watch, uh, you know, as mute spectators. Right. Perhaps we need to chip in and, you know, lend our weight in whatever we can. Yes. May I ask a quick question? Of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was wondering whether there exists some uh, logic for partial knowledge. Because in general, we used to take a decision depending on some partial, I mean, partial understanding of something kind of uh, in practical uh, scenario. So yes, there after, is. Okay. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Uh, the, the, the problem is not whether there is knowledge, but the problem really is that there is too much knowledge, right? I mean, like if you're a child and you go into an ice cream shop and there are 10,000 flavors of ice cream available, mm -hmm. you'll, be, you'll be totally disturbed, right? And I think that in, in academia, often it happens like that. Maybe not 10,000, but certainly a thousand flavors of ice cream will be available because logicians yeah. are used to churning Perhaps out Jana, can you, uh, uh, may I see your face? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Purvita actually comes to a discussion group that I arrange, and uh, we have a we have a tentative tentative plan uh, in which I hope Ravi will uh, go along for Purvita to come to America for a month or two and do some work together. Yes. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Yeah. I mean, uh, as an aside. Uh, I'm right now, as I was sharing it with Professor Kulkarni yesterday, yes. uh, trying to pose it, uh, you know, in my own small way, uh, the idea of justice as the most fundamental principle of life. I mean, uh, once we accept it and understand why it should be accepted as a basic action, if you like, yes. uh, then most of the problems in our society uh, will have been addressed. Yes. Uh, I mean, that is the, that is the, uh, that is the thesis that I'm trying to you know, work out on. I wrote a three, four page article. Maybe I, once it's complete, I'll share it with you. Uh, that's why I was interested in this book uh, that you referred to. Steve <clears throat> Brown's, Steve Brown's. No, no, Theory of Justice. Theory of Justice, right. But right. Uh, do you agree with my point that uh, essentially what Ross is proposing is the max min strategy and the max min strategy may not be appropriate for the whole society because it focuses on the very bottom of the society and does not help the middle class. This is the reason why middle class in most developed countries have done badly because too many resources have gone to the very bottom because after all, they're the ones for whom we feel the most sympathy, but then you have to develop the middle class, otherwise society will get nowhere. Right. So what is the main burden of his song in his book uh, that you have read? I mean, uh, I'm very keen to have a look at it once I'm able to stumble on it. Well, the, 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 in fact, uh, he, he says the following, let's suppose that uh, there is a veil of ignorance, that's, that's his phrase, and you have to choose between two societies. This is my paraphrase of what he said, but that you have to choose between two societies and you don't know who you will be in that society, which society will you choose, right? And Raul says, obviously you'll choose the society in which even the worst off are quite well off. So essentially, Rawls is focusing on the people who are worst off. But the problem is that if there is another society where the worst off are not that well off, but there are many more opportunities, then you might go to the society where uh, there are many more opportunities. For example, in America, many people immigrate to America, even though America doesn't have as strong a social safety net as Europe. And why do they do that? Because America is more opportunities. You have a better chance of becoming a billionaire or a billionaire in America than you do in Europe, right? So uh, Ross is failing to take account of the fact that a society consists of 
lots and lots of people at very different levels, and you have to help them all. That discriminating against Asians applying to Harvard is not the right way. Mm -hmm. Sophie. Yeah. yeah. Sophie, yes, please. I please. can send you the soft copy of that book, Theory of Justice. Oh, very oh, good. Great. <laughs> Both uh, please do. Uh, yeah. Yes, my best time. Uh, all right, all right. Yeah, please send it to me also because I do have a hard copy, but uh, on a soft copy, it's easier to use it for talks and make comments and so on. Right, right. So, and, and, Mukuji, and, have read it? Uh, not yet, but I have the book. I was busy in uh, some of the other things on in during my sabbatical, but I I wish to read these things uh, in detail. I right. have some, but uh, uh, honestly speaking, not yet. Yes. So please, but actually, Professor Parikh, please provide me your uh, yeah. email. Maybe yeah. you can write in the chat box. Sure, I can. Or you you can just Google me. It's okay, easy. okay, 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 okay. I will send. You. Yes, yes. But, no, no. But about yes. you, about your having this book and not reading it, there was a cartoon in Facebook that I saw about a woman who is looking with a very sad face over a certain wall. And the one woman represents all the books that you own, which you have not read. And she's looking at you. She, she's one of the books you haven't read. And she's looking at you as you're buying even more books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, so, yes. so she's saying, what, what about me? What about me? <laughs> right. So please read that book. But it, yes, it's, yes. it's very, very fast, actually. And I would, I, I would read. I, I, I will read and I will let you know my view. Uh, yeah, but but be aware of the game theory issue I raise, and the fact that in my view uh, that book is directly responsible for the discrimination against Asians in admission at Harvard and Yale because Asians are considered as they're okay, they're smart, they have good income, they don't commit crimes. Why should we do anything for them, right? This is the wrong attitude. But oh, it's I'm reading this book too these days. Ah. Yes, 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 yes. Right, right. Cake right. cutting, which is uh, which has an overlap with the you know fair division. Yeah. Yes, very well, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Where do you teach? I teach uh, in Srinagar, uh, Kashmir University. I see. I see. Yeah. So, so, so write to me and maybe send me one or two papers of yours, but only one or two. Well, I don't have many <laughs> to put. <laughs> Yeah. No, but I'm like I'm like the person, the, the, the kid in the ice cream shop where there are 10,000 flavors. He doesn't order ice cream at all. But if there are only three, <laughs> he, he can Oh, say, yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> problems are plenty. <laughs> yes, That's problem. always a problem. Right, right, right. Okay. So are you familiar with the work of uh, Daniel Kahneman? Uh, not really. No. <laughs> If you if you go to the Nobel Foundation site, there is a there is a Nobel lecture by Daniel Kahneman. He's a wonderful speaker, absolutely wonderful. Okay, he's a he's he's a, he's a mathematician he, or an economist. He, he's a, he's a psychologist, but he won the Nobel Prize in economics, I think, in two thousand two. Okay, I know him a little bit. When I say a little bit, I mean very very slightly. But I once had dinner with him and a bunch of other people, and he has sent me an email. But uh, but mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's a brilliant man, and he and he, he in fact talks about a lot of these issues about how we human beings are irrational in the way we make decisions about ourselves and the decisions about uh, our relations with others. So there is one example that he gives, which is really brilliant, <clears throat> where a person is asked to choose between severe pain for ten minutes followed by mild pain for one minute. And the other choice is, is severe pain for 10 minutes with nothing afterwards, right? So <laughs> one is severe pain for 10 minutes and just that. And the other is severe pain for 10 minutes, added one mild pain for one minute. And majority of people prefer the 10 minutes plus one to the 10 minutes, right? So there, there are wonder, wonderful examples in that noble lecture. So, I mean... Uh... What is the most <laughs> optimal choice, by the way? I mean, <laughs> well, he doesn't. He doesn't accept the current theory of what optimal choice is because the of the current theory, which goes back to von Neumann-Morgenstern, is maximize the expected utility. 
but he sees that people don't do that. And then he has, uh, th there, is, there is a theory proposed by him and Tversky, right? So does his model uh, give the second option as more optimal? I, I don't know that he's, I, I think it's, he's, he's more descriptive than, uh, what do you call it? Uh, in other words, he doesn't, he, he tells you what you do. He doesn't give you advice. Okay. <clears throat> he doesn't say, choose the one with the less pain, but he rather says, why are you choosing the one with more pain? Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful lecture, wonderful examples. That's Kahneman. I'll, 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 I'll write down both things. Yeah. So it's Daniel Kahneman. And my email is I'm sorry. Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman, Nobel in 2002 version. So I was right about uh, 2002, was I? Yeah, uh, the, the, work, the work was jointly done with uh, uh, Amos Tversky, but Tversky had died, and so Tversky didn't share in the Nobel Prize. And I, I, my, my feeling is that between the two of them, Tversky was the better, better mathematician, and uh, Kahneman was the psychologist. So you've also given your email ID. Yeah, let me just note it down. Yeah, it's roitparik32 at gmail.com. Thirty-two appears to be a year of birth. <laughs> no, I think I think Gmail just chose it. I don't know why they chose it. Or maybe I chose it because it, it has no connection with anything else. So it's hard for another person to guess. Thank you. In 1932, I wasn't born. Okay. So I will read uh, 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 one uh, little paragraph about, uh, you know, as a preamble uh, to my article on uh, justice. Uh, uh -huh. uh, can I crave your indulgence for a minute? Yeah, uh, why don't you share screen? Uh, so it at least like... the abstract. Well, I mean, let me see if I can. <clears throat> I don't think I can, I mean, because uh, there is no host around, I guess. Yeah, share screen, right, yeah, here it is. Uh, is that visible? Not yet, but it will, yeah. Can you see that? Yes. Uh, it could be a little pedantic, you know, the first line, but I'm trying to, <clears throat> write something more modest uh, as the title. So uh, should I read it aloud? A uh, little bit of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the lines uh, that I have written below, it's not intended to invoke scriptures, drive home the importance of the idea of God or of the, or of the uh, day of judgment, which constitutes fundamental articles of faith across religions and schools of religion God around the world. The idea is to make a humble attempt, being pretentious, to lend a certain amount of credibility to these concepts, <clears throat> God and uh, uh, Day of Judgment, as fundamental pillars of religious thought on the basis of the idea of justice being offered as a fundamental principle in order to make whatever little, si little sense one can 
of such complex issues as of life while making a case for accepting and according it the status of a universal epistemic uh, virtue across caste creeds communities and religious persuasions so uh, uh, i mean the lines of uh, that follow this uh, opening paragraph i have tried to you know drive home this point uh, that uh, if you invoke uh, the idea of justice as a fundamental axiom like the axiom of choice then uh, you know many contradictions contradictions can be hoped to be resolved i mean like uh, you know might is right for example which is uh, which is the order of the day right now this will go for a toss if we accept it and accept it uh, uh, with <clears throat> fervor and uh, uh, understanding why the idea of justice should be accepted as a fundamental principle. Yeah, but you know, the most scientists, are, uh, at least half the scientists do not believe in God. So what is the idea of God you're going to sell them? No, I'm saying uh, it's not uh, whether someone believes or not, but uh, uh, my attempt is uh, to pose it the idea of justice as uh, as a basic action which will help explain the idea of god i mean maybe uh, you okay, know okay uh, but when it comes to god is it like a, some in neuter gender brahman consciousness that probably uh, uh, right, that I mean, probably yeah. uh, that is probably acceptable to scientists but yeah, if, exactly. you say, if you say if you say he is a uh, He's a male, and uh, uh, he has this day of judgment. This day, day of judgment is so foreign to uh, Indians, the, uh, the people no, in the people in non-Abrahamic traditions. It is completely foreign. No, but then I mean, if you if that idea is foreign, then the idea of justice ought to be foreign to them. No, no, it's not. There is not a single day of judgment for an individual. If individual comes and goes, comes and goes, and he can improve uh, over the lifetime. He or she can improve on the, over the lifetime. That is the yeah, idea. I mean, yeah, what? yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, the question is, you know, uh, there is uh, there is that mechanism of retribution for whatever you do, maybe in the form of uh, you know reincarnation or the or a day uh, when we will be resurrected. I mean, either of these will be punished and rewarded depending upon our actions. And it is the idea of justice that would motivate. Yes, yes. So, so you do get uh, retribution and you do get reward. But there is a, uh, if you have done something bad, you have a possibility of Im improving on it in the future. Exactly. By coming no, again I... and again. It's so, not just this, this, this day of judgment in a single individual life. Right. Uh, and you say that it is uh, uh, whatever happens, whatever he does or she does in life. The, uh, no, no. Actually, know. that is a that is the that is the latter part of discussion. I mean, whether there is a single day of judgment or a single phase of judgment, or it happens in a continuous manner, uh, in the form of reincarnation. So that is a subsequent issue. So that has to be taken up later. But then there is going to be retribution in whatever form. Depending yeah. upon our mindset, our you know our but benefit. they 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 have retribution not at the end of the world or whatever. It is I, I, yeah, just as in usual but life. Our, we... yeah, Professor Kulkarni, I mean that stands reason. I mean that we have to. I mean that that depends upon our own worldview, as I said. But then uh, the world or life has come into existence as a result of an accident, or it's just random. Uh, that is thought to be, you know, exploded as a myth. I mean, there's nothing random about our life on Earth, about the cosmos, about how, uh, you know, phenomena take place. It can't be that. So uh, we have to develop a mechanism, uh, yes, which I think... I, I, I'm trying to, uh, you know, uh, understand through the idea of justice. So as I said, it's a sub, it's, it's a different issue, whether it is in the form of a continuous process of reincarnation, or uh, a phase or a day of judgment. So that, that, that's another story. But it's not that whatever we do here, 
we will get away with it without reward or attribution. So that I'm trying to. No, no. There is a reward. There is an attribution, and there is a, uh, a, a mukti or moksha. Uh, I exactly. guess there is no appropriate uh, word for moksha in uh, Abrahamic religions. Right. Yeah. Najat. There is no appropriate Salvation. word for moksha. Yes. Yeah. Buddhism is nirvana. Nirvana. And Jainism also is moksha. Yes. Kevagna, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not ruling them out of discussion. I'm saying those are the possibilities as much as the yeah, day of okay. judgment. Okay, that, that, yeah, that's good. Then the idea of justice, there is the idea of justice, uh, the concept of Ruta, Ruta in Sanskrit, I know. What is that? Yes. Uh, Rohit, can you say? Uh, Ruta, in Gujarati it is Riti. Yeah, but can you explain the concept? You are better in that. It's a, uh, uh, it's sort of like it's a, it's it's a notion of the way. So can I add? It's it's a, if I might refer to my talk. It's a it's a restriction. R. Rit, rit, from rit the word richa is coming in Rig Veda or any other yes. Veda, and exactly. it means eternal truth. The truth which does not change with time or anything else. Right. This is Rit, or Rit, what you say. This yeah. is the eternal truth. So, I would like to mention another point, which is maybe less... Uh, this, less... Is, this is written in, uh, in uh, Amar Kos, hmm. Sanskrit uh, language. Yeah. So. So that is the exact meaning of Rita. And yes. therefore, our masters, they believed in writing richas rather than just truths. Because yes. if there is a boy, it is, a, it, is a, it is true. But after 20 years, he will not be a boy. Uh, yes. So it, so it is not an eternal truth. So what would be the appropriate equivalent for it, uh, Rita, in, uh, say, English language? Eternal truth. Truth for that, all the time. And I would say it is uh, independent of everything. I, I would say rather rather than eternal, I would use the word timeless. Yes, okay, good, 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 good. Okay, sir. I agree. I agree. Timeless truth, you mean? Hmm. <clears throat> it is not bound by the concept of time. Time is also a concept in this. Yeah, yes. justice falls uh, uh, in that yeah. ambit. Yeah. I would like to make another point, which is uh, on this issue, though coming from a different place. And there is a there is a psychologist called Jonathan Haidt, H A I D T, at NYU. And in a, in a talk of his, he raises the following issue: that among various different species, there are there are species which create elaborate structures. For example, termites. For example, ants. For example, bees. Right. And in all of these cases, the, the, the explanation is biological. They, the, all the ants have the same DNA, all the bees is the same DNA. But humans are the only species with, which have a large, uh, large collections of people who do not have the same DNA, but who collaborate on large projects. And the question is, why, why does he, why do they do that? And he says that faith plays a role. In other words, that if you have the same faith as another person, and a lot of people have the same faith, then you can get together and a, and a large group has power, which a single individual doesn't have. And I will tell you a personal story about myself, which is that a very, very long time ago, I wanted to buy a copy of the Rigveda. I was not able to find a copy in Mumbai. Right? And nor was I able to find a copy in, in Delhi. Eventually, I found a copy of, uh, of, of the Rig Veda in, uh, in, uh, in, in Varanasi. Now, the question is, one could say that Rig Veda is the foundation of Hinduism. It would be strange to live in a Christian country and not be able to find a copy of the Bible. But I had this, this experience with the Rig Veda. And the answer is that most Hindus are Hindus without having any idea what the Rig Veda says. Right. And what do they have? I mean, they worship idols. And I have a feeling that most people don't have any idea what the shivling actually stands for. Right. And so 
it, it's, it's it's the symbols to which many people subscribe. And if enough people subscribe to the same symbol, then they become a powerful group and they don't have to ask, what does this symbol stand for? So for example, what you about see? the hijab? What about the hijab, which Muslim women wear? What is the meaning of it? There isn't a meaning. The point is, when you have a very, very hijab, you're saying, I'm a Muslim woman. When a woman has a dart on her forehead, she's saying, I'm a Hindu woman. And what does it mean? She doesn't know, right? So, or often she doesn't know. So these meaning, meaningless things become meaningful as soon as a large number of people subscribe to it and they become the centers of rituals. That is correct. So they, that is the responsibility of the intellectuals. Yes. Which is a, necessarily a small group. Yeah. What they what they say, the people, other people will follow. Yes. In some ways. And so the if the intellectuals say five percent of the intellectuals agree on something, yeah. that will have a, a far more impact than yes. trying to uh, uh, get this ninety five percent to agree on one particular thing. Right, right. Probably this was the reason to understand the religion in a in a proper manner. It, it yeah. was the great vision of Mahamanaji who started the faculty of Sanskrit Vidya Dharma Vigyan. Yes. So, and probably this is the only university in the universe which uh, which deals with these issues. And even I have seen in several Turkish universities, they have uh, several courses on religion. I mean, faculty of religion is also over there. Yes. And in several countries, they have ministry of justice rather than ministry of law. Yeah. We don't believe in the, I don't know, I mean, how much one can rely on the ministry of law if the justice is not there. Yeah. Yes, so, that's a very important point. So correct, correct way of thinking over is that to have ministry of justice rather yeah. than ministry of law. Right. They are making laws, it's okay. So it is the work of parliament, but we need ministry of justice. And then after all, we need justice. <laughs> and but do we all agree on what justice is? Uh, I think we at least agree that the, whatever the laws that your parliament passes, they are provisional laws. They are yes. not. They are not timeless laws. They are not timeless. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I agree. I agree. Yes. Is is it something like non-violence? Yes. That's that's a timeless principle. It is. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. I, I think it's everybody's urge. Every living beings are that uh, the other living be, uh, being should not be hurt physically or even mentally. Yes. Science by its nature itself is social. Yes. And uh, at, at least we can think of about those axioms which are independent of different religions. Yes. Yes. At least some common axioms must be over there on which uh, every religious person can rely. Yeah, as and a matter of fact, among the, the theory can be developed. Among, so the, ten, among the Ten Commandments of, of Moses and the five precepts of the Buddha, there is a great deal of overlap because yes. three of the commandments occur also in the Buddha. Yes. So your point, Mr. Sripati, is completely right. You see what the United Nations talks about human human values. Yes, I think that is yeah. What is is whatever the discussion goes on human values are uh, that is uh, that is Ritha, that is Dharma, whatever. Yes, yes, sir. yes, sir. yes. Sir. The only problem with the United Nations is the following: that at the time that it was founded. Yes. Then, the, then, the, then the democracies which were most prominent were America, England, and to, to a large extent also France. France was, had been under German rule, but France also had the re revolution. And so the consequence is that the United Nations is very heavily Western. I'm not saying that the, 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 the values are bad, but it means that the East has not played a sufficient role in defining the mission of the United Nations. 
And that's, that's a mistake because now the East is becoming more and more powerful and more and more vocal. And it finds that the United Nations does not completely suit it. Of course, we go along because many of the things in the United Nations Charter we recognize as true, but we also notice what it leaves out. Yeah, but no. Yeah, you know, it is difficult. It, it is difficult to make a definition of uh, dharma. <laughs> of course, of course. But yeah. now, look at the United Nations Security Council, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Now, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's among its permanent members are, are France and England and Russia yeah. and China yeah. and the United States. And France and England are tiny compared to India. And yet India is not a member of the of the United Nations Security Council because India was not even free when it was founded, right? So there is there is a kind of a distortion of values, right? <laughs> yeah, that can be, yes. I think but Indian I... and Chinese values should need to play, they need to play a bigger role in the United Nations. Yeah, yes. No, no but I just said that Human values. I mean, that is approximately what dharma is, dharma or ritha yes. or that is right. we are talking about. These, yes. these are not the specific laws of Moses. No. Or, uh, yeah. May I add something in this discussion? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Actually, actually, um, uh, like my opinion in some sense is like that. Most of the religion actually came into the picture with some noble goal. But the problem is with the interpretation of the latter persons. So yes. to me, like if we uh, propose some of the axioms or rules, the problem will be still there because interpretation may be different. And that interpretations are harmful in some sense, like yes. to me. So that is the idea I was thinking about. Right. Mm. But no, I'm, I'm the, not... Right. Yeah, for example, I mean, there are certain ideas, certain concepts which are, you know, quote unquote, uh, secular. Uh, they don't have any religious connotation to it. I mean, the need is for us to propagate those ideas and yes. base our, uh, you know, working, our understanding, our interactions on the right. basis of those, <clears throat> those actions, those principles. Instead but of saying, sure. instead of saying secular, I would say spiritual. Yes. <laughs> ah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> sure about the nobility of the original goals. Because, for example, when Moses propounded, and Moses, of course, was very, very long of when he propounded his, his Ten Commandments, there were Jews who did not agree with them. And what did Moses do to them? All the men were killed and the, and the women were enslaved. So a lack of nobility was already there at the very beginning. I mean, Moses said, thou shalt not kill. And then he proceeded to kill those Jews who didn't accept the commandments. I right? think... Uh... That is apocryphal. I mean, to the extent I have understood uh, yeah. the story surrounding Moses. I, see. Uh, I mean, not that kind of <clears throat> stuff that we know about him. All I'm I am trying to say is that, uh, <clears throat> for example, I mean, at, a, at, a, at, a, <clears throat> at a more mundane level, yes. whatever faith or religious uh, belief uh, we come to have been accidentally you know, endowed with, yeah. uh, Maybe we uh, imparts, you know, what I say, you know, what I call post facto justification to it. The yeah. thing is, you can, you, I mean, you, one should avoid, uh, you know, finding fault with other faiths which are disjoint or which are contrary or which don't quite gel with yes. uh, the kind of belief that you are, uh, you know, espousing. So uh, someone has a, for example, we have been uh, talking about it uh, for a period of time, uh, myself, Professor Kulkarni. Uh, for example, idol worship. Okay, yes. I mean, Muslims don't believe it as uh, kosher. Uh, they say, huh, well, uh, we, uh, we, don't, we don't accept it as a form of worship, whereas yes. Hindus do. So Which my contention is that, okay. Yeah, my content is that, okay, I mean, all right, I don't believe in it, I won't practice it, but uh, so be it. If others do it and they get moksha, they get salvation, they get mukti, and uh, that's fine. You get mukti, you get satisfaction, you get consolation by practicing a certain <laughs> set of rituals or a certain set of, uh, you, know, uh, <clears throat> you know, chores, religious chores. 
Uh, that's your way of approaching God, and someone has someone else has some other uh, way of approaching God. You know what we are talking about is what Shankaracharya was talking in the, on the first page of his commentary on the Gita. Uh -huh. Okay, you know that he's uh, he's talk. Uh, uh, this Vedanta is a reaction to Mimamsa. Mimamsa is for rituals. Vedanta is away from rituals. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, then they yes. see what understand the meaning of the rituals. I, I, I take one example the sanskaras. Uh, uh, how do you translate sanskaras? Uh, I, every religion has this uh, some celebration at the time of birth, some celebration at right, the time of right, yeah. the person is taken to a, a, a school, uh, then marriage. And uh, uh, the last rites, these these four are common to many many yeah, more. These are sanskaras. All the, uh, yeah. all the religions. The other other things they can vary from uh, uh, from uh, religion to religion. So, but those those things. Now, for instance, this taking the person to uh, at the age of eight or ten to the teacher. Why is it restricted to males? Even in Hindu society, it is restricted to, it is largely restricted to males, but they say that originally it was not that way. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And so now some of the progressive families, they consider now the uh, women have started uh, learning also, uh, getting educated. So the appropriate form of the ritual should be performed even for girls at the age of eight and 10, uh, called this open air. And it should not be ridiculed, it's, it should be sanctified. It was there, earlier it was there, sir. Yes. And sanskara means sacrament in English, yes. in English language. What is it? Sacrament. Sacra S a sacrament, sacrament. Sacrament, yes. 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 And uh, even the caste system in India and in yeah. the Hindu society, yeah. it was not uh, before second century. There was no caste system. Yeah. And uh, somehow, some places, how it was involved and the Hindus uh, adopted it, uh, it is something really challenging to understand. I don't think you're right. I think the caste system was there. Uh, uh, and it was it was even there in some Indo-European societies, which are not Indian, because the division into Brahmins, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas, that division is, is very old. I think the, the Shudras and Untouchables are more recent additions. But the, in the, the Vedic society, in, in the Vedic period, it was really not there. No, no, the point is whether the, it is based on your uh, guna and karma, or whether it is based on your birth. Caste refers to birth. Yes, so, so caste birth. referred to birth. It was not before second century. That's uh, your claim, but I think you're wrong. No, it is true. Uh, it is true. It is true. No, you can't say it's true. I, no, I, no, I, can, I can give no. you several proofs. No, no. no, 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 no. I, you know, you know, you know. Gita in Gita, they it does talk about Brahman, Kshatriya, uh, uh, Vaishya, Shudra, but it not, says Chatur Varanyam. Maya Srishtam, that he says, I have created this. Guna Karma Vibhaga Shaha. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's yes, a very sir. clear statement. And yes, I agree. I yes. agree. But it is not because of birth. It's not because of birth. Yes, sir. That I'm exactly saying. The caste system, depending on birth, it was not before second century in India. There you may be and right, yes. And how much India was lost that time, I don't know. What was the structure and what was the things over there? So what was the uh, what was the origin of the caste system? I mean, it derives from uh, birth mainly and what other considerations could there possibly be? Not, not birth. The, the what, uh, the actual profession that you choose in your life, karma and uh, what are your qualities? Qualities. Yeah, abilities, Abili abilities, and uh, and quality. Whether you are a calm person, you are a violent person, yes, you are a lazy so you person. Then you can't, uh, you know, 
call it caste. I mean, it could be discrimination on the basis of your levels of competence. It is. Aptitude. It is not a discrimination. It is. It is just. Uh, it is just classification. Uh, so that yeah, happens even now. <laughs> that happens even now. They, no, but the people come with different uh, attitudes, and they take to different professions. So if I if I go to selling vegetable, I should be called a Vaishya, not Brahmin. Yes. So I mean, something will get attached to a name as a result of your profession, right? It is the things are too much complex. It is nothing to do with even names. I think I, I think that we are deconstructing Hinduism because yeah, the idea sure, sure. that that caste is not due to birth that idea was made very prominent by the Buddha. Yes. And I think that it's it's distinct from from Hindus because I remember the story about when uh, when Draupadi no. was was no, no, no. Please, 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 let me finish. No. Please, Sir, I, I, I need to add, Buddha himself was a Hindu. May I, may I, finish, may I finish speaking and then you can interrupt? Yes, yes please. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Please don't interrupt. Okay, so the, the point is that uh, when uh, when Karna was, when, you know, Draupadi had this Vamsara and Karna was not, uh, was wanted to compete and then he was refused to compete on the grounds that he was not a, he was not a Kshatriya. And then at that point, Duryodhana stepped in and said, I'm making Karna a king, right? There's also a, uh, another story about, uh, about I think, Ekalavya, the, the one who wanted to learn from Drona, and Drona refused him, right? So, so th there, are, there, are, there are cases going back long ago, right? And I think, I think that when you say that Buddha was, was himself a Hindu, that's irrelevant because the point is that it is not Buddha as the Hindu who said that caste is not by birth, but Buddha after he was enlightened who said it. So you cannot connect the two. You are, when you say he was a Hindu, you're talking about Siddhartha and not about Buddha. Yeah. You are absolutely right, yeah. And you I know, the, the actual injustices have happened. But and we have to accept that. My simple point is that Buddhism was not created by Buddha himself. Never, never, never. Christianity was not created by Christ himself. Never, never, never. He was fighting for the cause of uh, those... Uh, uh, I mean, the people who, who were working very hard in the Europe. But what happened after Christ? Millions of people were murdered, killed in the name of Christianity. So things are Who's very, it? very much serious. In every religion it happened. And nobody is taking responsibility. And even in some religions, you cannot even question. You cannot even discuss the things. What kind of closed religions these are? For example, yeah, in support of you, what you say, Mukuji, uh, Islam is by no means something which was, uh, you know, propagated or invented uh, for the first time by Muhammad. It wasn't. Well, Karni, sir, I will send you some files. So you were talking about propaganda of a religion. And it was really very, very much discussed in detail in the parliament, before parliament. I will send you those uh, files very soon. And then you I can see what happened in our country. Even send it in to all country. of us. Send yes. it to all of us. We shall discuss the, these issues. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know how you look at it, but uh, it's not, uh, uh, you know, specific to Christianity or Hinduism. It happens uh, across the board. As I yes. said, Muhammad was not the one who uh, came uh, and invented Islam as a religion. No way. Who was? Pardon? Who was? If not Muhammad, who was? Well, it was Abraham. And before that, many other prophets. Uh, and then uh, over a period of time, uh, things got messed up. And uh, uh, as we are told, they lost the way and uh, the religion of Islam, it gave way, uh, it gave way to, you know, other, uh, call it religions or 
quasi religions or whatever and then uh, muhammad came and resurrected it kind of brought uh, you know fresh life to it now the uh, one thing about this uh, in it will be hard to sell to the scientists why is muhammad the last prophet well i mean this is uh, 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 there, there are, are prophets uh, afterwards there were prophets before at that particular time and at that particular locality I, he was probably the wisest man i i agree and at that time maybe the first first 10 years of his uh, 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 what they call the makka year and the after the uh, madina year he got politically powerful right uh, you know actually uh, when he came and he said um, i have come to complete the mission i mean these are the yes uh, yes kind of words so Je uh, jesus uh, also said the book, same thing no quran as the final book uh, is going to be uh, the leading light for you to follow henceforth and uh, it uh, takes care of all the previous scriptures they were uh, that were revealed on the prophets like on moses and uh, christ and uh, you know Uh, scriptures were it. not revealed to everybody that is it this is it that there are this all these scriptures in the eastern uh, religions dhammapad yeah or gita or or the other thing you see they were not politically promoted mm -hmm. they were yeah, accepted right. in the, they were accepted in their communities yeah very true now what i am trying to say is that uh, quran uh, which was revealed as we believe uh, on prophet muhammad uh, it was uh, revealed as the last book which took care of whatever drawback shortcomings there might have been in the previous scriptures i mean i am not able to you know put it in exact words but this is about it uh this was going to be the last book and no other prophet was going to be uh, brought back to earth and uh, well there is a philosophy behind it uh, why it was that way so it's it's quite a quite a quite a deep profound topic uh, maybe we need to you know revisit it again um, yeah we, 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 yeah we, we we do need i think yeah maybe we are discussing now for one hour <laughs> In, sir sir in my uh, childhood i used to sit with a learned person he was a muslim in my village his name was akbar ali and he was a tailor and uh, i really spent a lot of time with him and he loved me a lot he was telling too many stories what were already in the i mean in the muslim literature and also in the hindu literature for example if i he could explain very nicely the story of prahlad in hindu culture and the similar story is somewhere in the muslim culture and i was not that much aware at that time but several stories he was telling common to both kind of religions If I may ask, what is the story in Muslim literature which is similar to Pranath? Do you have any more details? He was not my teacher. He was a tailor. No, 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 no. But you are telling us that there was a similar story. Yes, the, similar. The, yeah, yeah. So, so he was so telling a bad, no, 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 bad no, no, I don't. Sense. I, I don't want to hear about the tailor. I want to hear about the story in the, in Islam which is similar to Pranath. Is there such sir, a story? Sir, sir, sir. I yes. was just you, six, seven you, years that time. Please. No, you please. said something. My awareness was it. so little that so I I sometimes think that at least some common things must be over there, out of all the religions, something. Or let us why not let us think about when there was no religion, for example, then how the human race was developing. So no, I, but, I'm asking that also can be. A, No, no. He, he, uh, Professor Parikh is arguing about Pralad. And right, Ur exactly. You say uh, there is something in Muslim similar to the story of Pralad, and I want you to either take it back or else give me details. But the story of no, no, no. The the, the story of Pralad is uh, uh, what aspects you want to uh, uh, does Professor Sophie know the story of Pralad? Uh, not really. Yeah, what's that? 
All right. Okay. So we we go on. Probably to you can meet one more person. I can suggest Professor Han Hanif Muhammad Sastri. He is in New Delhi. He tells so many stories common to both the religions, and he has been widely accepted. He was awarded some medal and some honor by the Vice President of India, and he is a Sanskrit scholar as well. What's his name? Hanif Sastri. Okay. Professor M. Hasan Sahib knows him well. Yeah, Professor Kulkarni, you were going to talk about Prahlad. Uh, no, the this uh, uh, the story of Prahlad is he was born to a uh, father is Hiranyakashipu. He did yes. not believe in God, whereas Prahlad was a great devotee of God, and uh, that is this that is how the story goes. And the uh, this uh, father tried to kill him many many things, and still he survived, and finally. Uh, that God came in the form of Narasimha. Yeah. And then he killed his, killed Prahlad's father. And at, at that time, that God is in a very fierce form and uh, very angry. So Prahlad calms him. And that that's uh, absolutely the, his uh, uh, his praise of that God. And how he calms him, that is in Bhagavad. It's a thing to read. Uh, <laughs> it's very beautiful. I, 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 know, uh, I know that part. Uh, well, I think it's getting late. And so, uh, and I also do not know anything by that heart. I'm not the professional. I, I, I have a vague memory of, of Pralad and Hiranyakashipu. Maybe, yes. maybe I'm wrong, people can correct me. But my understanding is that Hiranyakashipu was a devotee of Shiva. And he asked Shiva to make him immortal. And Shiva said, I cannot make you immortal, but I can allow you to impose some conditions under which you will die. And so Hiranyakashipu said, all right, I will not be killed by a man nor by an animal. I will not be killed at day nor at night. And I will not be killed indoors or outdoors. And Shiva said, fine. And then later on, uh, the Narsia, who was neither man nor animal, it's a mixture, right. uh, killed him at the doorstep, which was neither indoor nor outdoor, right. and yeah. killed him yeah. at dusk, which was not day nor night. He was not an atheist, but a devotee of Shiva. I can add one thing more. Please. In fact, this is, if we take all these things in the form of a story, it looks like something history. But many of these stories, they are in fact just to teach the people in the spirituality somehow. What is yes. it, it is something, the tendency or the quality of a person who always tries to sleep on, on, the, on the bed made up of uh, something gold like that. So always to be, I mean, just uh, running after the wealth and uh, the, the materialistic world. And this, this quality cannot be killed by any, any of these things. And this was the reason that uh, this, this form of uh, power was chosen to kill all these, all these bad qualities of a human being. And this, these things were taught in our old schools 6,000 years back in the Vedic schools. Even even before, even before these English people invaded our country, there were 1.8 million Vedic schools in India. They destroyed all. They looted our country 43 millions of gold and asarfid in, in their 200 years. And now they are teaching us the human quality, human being, and human <laughs> rights. And we are not no, able to no. talk with them. So far as the Pralla story goes, I think let's read it from the original Bhagavad. It's in the fourth chapter of Bhagavad. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, somebody can volunteer and go to Bhagavad and read that story. Uh, and his, uh, this famous, uh, his uh, ode to Narsimha, uh, there are some 50 stanzas there. It's partly Vedanta, partly devotion. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I wish to share one thing, a very short. Please, please. Uh, 
uh, yeah, actually, uh, recently in, in Bengali, actually, I forget the name of the author. He is trying to interpret all those uh, mythological stories or whatever we do have uh, ideas about God and goddess and all. He is trying to interpret that how it could be if we think them as a human being or something like that. And to him, he is somehow trying to portray that this Shiva, Brahma, Vishnu, Indra, those were the name of the position. And many people used to came to hold that position. That is why we could realize this, those kind of after, or many Indras are there actually in the stories of mythology and all. So yeah. there are a huge, uh, I think at least two or three books are there, but I forget the name of the author right now. So in that sense, maybe we can think about that, what the concept of God maybe in some sense and to him those are like arjo and anarjo so god were somehow the uh, people from the arjo who lived uh, in the opposite side of hindu kush Parbot, and the anarjo were in the other side and they came and they had some more power than them and they were trying to portray themselves as god or something like that so that story is there actually so i forget the name actually so Urbita, where are you living and working I'm, I'm actually originally from Kolkata, but right now I'm at IIT Kanpur. So, uh, you are doing what? Uh, I'm a DST women scientist uh, and in mathematics department. Which department? Mathematics and statistics department. Oh, I see. Uh, you are very near to Banaras Hindu University. Why not to visit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I came there. <laughs> Yeah. So have we met in IIT Kanpur? I keep going there once in a while. That's my alma mater. That's why. I don't think so because I came here around 2019 and after coming here, the corona started. So okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, before that, I was in IMSC actually. So it's not a So you are a faculty there or uh, you are uh, doing postdoc? No, it's DST Women Scientist. So I do have a project. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Great, great. Stay in touch. Mukuchi, please uh, write down your uh, email ID on the uh, <clears throat> chat box. Yeah, sure. I, I have written, sir. Uh, okay, just, just one more time. Professor Parikh, uh, it has been uh, quite illuminating to interact with you this evening. Uh, Professor you. Kulkarni has always been a beacon of light for all of us. Thank and, you. Uh, it, Thank was, you. it was a wonderful um, uh, interaction. Uh, uh, over the last couple of years and a uh, couple of hours. And uh, with Professor Kulkarni, it has been a long association, as I said this morning, of uh, a period spanning about 15 or maybe more. Actually, yeah. I don't know your name. It says HP, and I know you're not Hewlett Packard, but other than that, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, that is the name of my computer, MS Sophie. I mean, Sophie. I mean, Sophie. And is it? Uh, he's in correspondence with uh, our group in SIA. How do you spell Sophie? S O F I. I see. S O F I. Right. And I mean, of course, I know because there are millions of people called I mean. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I would I would say uh, you know there is Diana Eck. She's a professor at Harvard Divinity School. Yes. And she's a Christian, but she also has a degree from Banaras Hindu University. And uh, we invited, Ravi and I invited her to give a talk in June. And she said that she can't do it because uh, her husband is not well <coughs> and she's taking care of him. Okay. But she, she agreed to give a talk later on, maybe in the fall. And I was thinking maybe we can organize a conference on October 1 and 2, because October 2 is Gandhiji's birthday. And if we say it is Gandhiji's birthday, then many people will say, how can I say no to that? So we will get good speakers. And uh, it, it's basically around the time that Ravi Kulkarni wanted. He said September, but October 1 and 2 is almost September. What do you think? Your timing, uh, timing you decide, but the what is the topic of the, uh, uh, I was thinking more like a uh, single topic. Yeah, I know. But I think first we invite the speakers. Yeah. Having, having in mind a loose topic. And then after we see who has accepted, then we uh, create a name, which, which uh, sort of includes all of them. Now, do you want to invite uh, 
this Professor Ali Khan? Yes. Uh, yes. Professor Akil Bilgrami? Uh, oh. Yeah. Probably, but the thing is, the problem with Ali Khan and Akil Bilgrami is that they're already our friends and we've already heard, heard from them. And no, if no, we, are but, we are invited, no, four invited speakers, and one of them is Dana Ek and the Akil Bilgrami and Ali Khan. Okay, okay. Then okay. We will, you Dana, see what Dana I mean? Ek. There will be no room for new people. And also Gane, uh, Ganeri that you mentioned. Ganeri, right. Ganeri, right. 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 So we could have these four, but then we'll have we'll have people we've already heard before. So let's let's uh, uh, sort of like reach out. Yes, sure. Uh, okay, now I think uh, let's uh, say this is the day for us. The yes. Day is over. Yes, thank so you. With Roy, uh, I just want to have the SIA talk. Uh, you can listen to that. There's nothing secret about it. Yeah. Uh, the in. Uh, June, then uh, what should we do? We ha I have invited somebody, but uh, that person has not responded yet. Okay, all right. I, I see, I see CG. I, I, I don't know the uh, name. Uh, no, I, well, I have not seen my emails the, for last, last the three first, days. The person I invited is Lakshmi Parida, because ah. for, for, two, for several reasons, one of them is we haven't had that many women speakers. That's one thing. The oh. other one is that she's an IBM fellow. And in the years in which she became an IBM fellow, there were only like seven people who became IBM fellows. So she is really up there, right? I mean, she's, a, she's, a, she's an Indian woman with a lot of distinction. And uh, I what hope is she, the subject? Yes. Uh, what uh, is she, she, work, she? She works in, um, in, in what is it called? Uh, she works in maybe molecular biology. Oh, OK. Uh, and yeah, probably she will talk on something on in uh, on molecular biology, something like that. She has also okay. written a book on cooking, but uh, I think that's no no molecular biology there. But it's, no, no, the, it's, the, 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 then you are welcome to pursue pursue that and fix the yeah. timing, timing right. and the uh, date, oh, uh, date and yeah. time. So I maybe... hope she will say yes. She's she's a former student of mine, so oh, okay, uh, she so may maybe. feel she may feel un, un, uneasy about saying no. So may, maybe third or fourth week of uh, June. Yes. Uh, on a Sunday, we meet yeah. on Sunday. Yes. Uh, it's uh, ten thirty. Right. In, in New York, which is about eight p.m. For in you. India. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, okay, that this is all tentative. Okay. So uh, on this note, I think we. Shall we disperse? Or? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pranam, sir. Barik, sir, Pranam, sir. Maaf kariya ga agar koi galti hui ho. No, no, don't, don't worry about it. I, I, I understand your enthusiasm. Tani, <laughs> sir, namaste, sir. It and enthusiasm so nice. is very common among us Indians. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mukherjee, please give me your email ID. Yes, I have, I, I have put, sir, in the, in the chat box. Tani, it's not there. I saw it. It's here, sir. MM Tripathi 66 at rate yahoo.com. MM Tripathi 66. Uh, without dots anywhere. Yes, sir. At, at rate yahoo.com or gmail.com. Yahoo. Thick hai. Bilkul thick hai. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. I, I will send you the book, sir. Ah, bahut yes. achha. You have my email ID? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got it. Okay, okay. Please do. Then I'll, I'll, I'll write uh, something. I think says, uh, uh, yeah, Mukundmani, send me that book to me. Yes, also. sir. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. I will send every one of you. Namaste, <laughs> sir. Okay, okay. Good night, everybody. Thank Good, you. Night. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and Professor po Sophie, you send your article. I'll, I'll do that presently. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank All right. Thank you. All right. So.